everybody welcome back to let's go geo as usual i'm your field guide heather and today we will be on another adventure this time again in nevada we've been exploring around parts of nevada and california and we'll be doing so in the coming weeks as well we're checking out some cool mineral belts and really unique geo features so it's been exciting around here lately when even have some new geo gadgets we've been working with so Today, we are going to be talking about mercury. That's right, it's that toxic element that you're thinking. We're going to be able to go on an adventure in these mountains, so we'll be able to see the rock environment that we find it in, and maybe find some other interesting mineral deposits. So I'm excited, let's get going. So I'm in the White Mountains in the Nevada, California border region. Pretty close to that Walker Lane we've been talking about. But today I'm up probably around 7,500 feet. Lots of different types of granite eroding out in this area. So there was definitely some intrusive igneous material as you can see. Down a little lower there was a lot of that andesite and basalt material. So there's also some extrusive igneous material around here as well. And adjacent to us, I know from looking at the geologic mapping, that there's also some sedimentary and metasedimentary material that's pretty common to the White Mountains. So we know the sedimentary material gets to be some of the older stuff, the Paleozoic units. And we also know that we have igneous material that represents some intrusions that happened in the Cretaceous. Now, some of these that I've looked at a little further south they have splendid crystals they're pegmatite size quartz crystals and big feldspar crystals more recently there was extrusive volcanic activity and that's where some of this kind of stuff comes from this must have eroded down from these hills and we're gonna head up here and check out Maybe we'll find some more volcanic activity in this region. That's the source of all of this, these different types of extrusive igneous rocks. We have volcanic breccias, tufts here, There's obviously a good source of silica, all kinds of just like ash deposit material. So again, silica rich, extrusive volcanic activity was occurring here. That must have been the source of some hydrothermal activity. This is promising because mercury tends to form in low temperature environments like volcanic hot springs and epithermal veins. This would have resulted in the movement of hot mineral laden waters that filled the cracks and the, the faults in these pre-existing rocks and then that would have deposited all the precious metals and interesting minerals that we can find in these regions. Hey, just a real quick message from me, Heather, the host here at Let's Go Geo. Actually, I am host, videographer, photographer, editor, creator, all that stuff. This channel is run solely by me, and I started it because I do love geology and all things related to the topic, and I love teaching, and I thought it would be a great way to bring to people that in the field experience, but digitally. So... Let's Go Geo was born. The project's going well, but I have a lot of great other ideas. So if you want to help me out, support me, and help the project move along, you can find me on Patreon, and you can become a fan there as well as get access to exclusive content. So head over to Patreon. Otherwise, let's get back to today's topic. Well, there's just a ton of extrusive volcanic material here, and heading up this old mining road, it's, it's probably a pretty old mining area. And it'll be really interesting to see what kind of minerals and environments we can find. Alright, so now I'm seeing just a ton of this chalcedony everywhere, all over the ground here. I wrote it out, you can see some really cool pieces. There's one right here. So, chalcedony is a, a cryptocrystalline version of quartz, and it just makes sense that we'd find it in this area with all this volcanic activity because it commonly forms in hydrothermal replacement deposits. Among other minerals I'd expect to find here, I'd expect to have a lot of sulfur content in the region, and that's going to give us those sulfide minerals. So, lead is actually normally not just lead in the environment. It's uh, lead sulfide. That's what galena is, so it's lead and sulfur. And there's other minerals that are also sulfides. Pyrite is an iron sulfide and mercury. Mercury is also not often found in just a native mercury form. 
it's not just pure mercury in the environment, we're more likely to find it as a mercury sulfide, cinnabar. So the symbol for native mercury or elemental mercury is HG. Where the heck does that come from? Well, it's a reference to Greek terminology, hydros and the combination with argios. Hydros refers to liquid and argios is a term that refers to silver. And that's where we get the concept of because it looked like liquid silver or quicksilver. Well, this road's getting awfully overgrown and you can barely even tell it's a road, but it's obviously been a while since anyone has been up here. Oh, there's some cans here, so some signs of prospectors from the past. I am wearing gloves today because we are in an environment where I might expect things like arsenic and of course possibly mercury and things that I, maybe even some radioactive elements uh, that I might not want to be just handling with my bare hands. It's actually good to wear gloves in all rock hounding environments, but these I'd say even more so. Native mercury is quite the interesting element. Mercury is the only naturally occurring liquid metal at room temperature. And while uncommon, it can sometimes be found naturally occurring in that peculiar metallic liquid form alongside a mercury ore like cinnabar. The most common mercury ore is cinnabar, and we can find that in recent volcanic hot spring environments and in epithermal vein environments where it's associated with opal, chalcedony, and dolomite, which matches the stuff we're seeing here today. These types of mercury forming environments like these epithermal veins we've been discussing are common in parts of western Nevada and eastern California where we see a lot of those cinnabar mines. And it's found in association with other epithermal vein minerals like stibmite, which is an antimony sulfide, and orpiment, an arsenic sulfide. Epithermal vein deposits comes from epi meaning shallow and thermal meaning heat, in this case, hot fluids. They form in areas of recent volcanism or convergent magmatic arc environments. The magmas create the hydrothermal fluids that deposit those minerals. This includes gold, silver, mercury, antimony, and copper, lead, and zinc. As mentioned, these are shallow deposits, meaning the shallower parts of the larger hydrothermal system, which ranges from temperatures up to 300 degrees Celsius and depths of 50 to 1500 meters below the water table. The thing to note about epithermal vein deposits is that they typically contain high-grade ores, but in small tonnage silica all over it so this must have had a lot of cracks and crevices to deposit silica and what i'm wondering is what other minerals might have deposited along along with that silica content very cool patterns on these these swirly banded and concentric looking patterns referred to as coliform and crustiform textures are diagnostic of epithermal veins other ores of mercury include timonite, which is also associated with those epithermal vein environments, and this oddly named agerbaleite, which is the first known silicate of mercury, only found in a few localities. Cinnabar is a mercury ore. We can use it as pure mercury, but it has to then be separated out from the ore. We have to separate the pure mercury from the sulfur, and this is done by heating and that then gives off sulfur dioxide. Um, not a great thing to breathe in, so you don't wanna just, for fun, heat up a mercury ore or a piece of cinnabar. Once that's done, then you do have pure mercury, and it can be used in a lot of different applications. Historically, mercury has been used particularly for that red hue in things like cosmetics and art applications. This has been documented all the way back to the Roman times. Now the Romans actually had mercury mines. They accessed this. The Romans kind of had a lot of mercury and lead around them in levels that were toxic. That's a whole nother discussion. But there was a mine in Spain that has been mined for a really long time and it's in Almadane, Spain, and it actually was mined back to the Roman times all the way up to modern times. They got a lot of mercury out of that area. It's, it's world renowned for its uh, mercury mines. It was pretty much a death sentence if you had to go mine mercury in those mines because of the constant exposure to toxic materials. 
the people that mined there were pretty much convicts and slaves. We obviously know other applications of mercury, like in our temperature detecting devices. Mercury has also been used because it is a good electric conductor. The medical and dental fields have also found uses for mercury, and we shouldn't forget one other major use throughout history, and that is in the gold rush. Mercury was highly useful in gold amalgamations. This was particularly useful after you exhausted, let's say, placer deposits and you didn't just find a little chunk of gold and you were hard rock mining and you had this gold that was essentially disseminated and you needed all these, all this ore and you needed to get fine metals out of this ore. How do you do that? Well, you crush it down and then you have a lot of material to go through and that's where mercury comes in and that you could then combine the gold with the mercury and like I said, then burn it off and be left with just the precious gold. Soon I'll actually take you guys on a tour of how that whole gold amalgamation process works. So stay tuned here at Let's Go Geo for that upcoming adventure. And one final use of mercury, not making any suggestions, but it has been used historically as a poison, of course. Speaking of mercury poisoning, in the 1970s, thousands of people were hospitalized and hundreds died from mercury poisoning in Iraq. They were experiencing a famine and countries were sending seeds for them to alleviate the famine, but those seeds had been treated with methyl mercury containing fungicide in order to keep down mold growth and preserve the seeds. Well, the seeds had been dyed red to serve as a warning, and there were warning labels posted on the bag, but those labels were were in Spanish because they originated in Mexico, and also the skull and crossbone symbol that the Westerners are so common with wasn't common to the Iraqis. This plan to provide them with seeds was perhaps not well thought out because in order to alleviate the hunger they were experiencing, they planned to crush the seeds down immediately rather than plant them and wait. And when they crushed down the seeds, they ended up ingesting that methyl mercury and poisoning themselves. Of course, if they'd planted the seeds, then the crop would not have been contaminated, but this was not on their mind at the time. Mercury's toxicity is such that it's not even been found to have any use for animal life. Now, microorganisms can convert it into methyl mercury. So how the heck does mercury even get in our environment? Well, primarily it cycles through the water and atmospheric cycles and comes from volcanic origins. Now it can also get into our atmospheric cycles through anthropogenic sources. This includes the burning of coal. And of course, all that gold mining during the 49ers years, that actually put a lot of mercury into those waters such that places like the American River around Sacramento are kind of toxic and there are major advisories for eating fish. In fact, all over our world now, there are advisories for eating fish because of mercury content. You're actually not even supposed to eat that much quantity of fish each week. There are amounts put out in advisories that tell you how much fish you can eat and sometimes how much fish you can't eat. There are sources where you shouldn't eat the fish at all. And there's one other source of mercury in the environment, and we might have a tough time classifying this as natural or unnatural, but a recent article by USC called it a mercury bomb. What's happening here is that Arctic permafrost is melting at ever-increasing rates and thereby entering the food chain. If you take a look at this photo of some ice-rich permafrost, actually it's a collapsed block of that permafrost. This photo was taken at Drew Point, Alaska. There are several problems that come along with this permafrost thaw and the erosion that is occurring, one of those being the changes in salinity when the ice is melting, the loss of sea ice and the erosional rates are reducing coastal protections, and of course those soils that might contain methane or mercury ends up accumulating in the local environment and mercury can go on to form methyl mercury, which as we mentioned before is toxic and bioaccumulative. Now, mercury can be found all over the world. And yes, since mercury forms in hot spring environments, it could even be forming today as we speak in places where we find hot springs. The demand for mercury spiked in the early 1900s, especially around war times. It's interesting to note that we typically speak of mercury production a little differently than you might be used to when it comes to, say, gold and silver, speaking of ounces or something like that. Instead, mercury production is measured in flasks, in most cases 76-pound flasks. Now let's take a quick look at some of the key places where mercury has been historically mined. 
Some of the hot spots include that region of Spain we've been talking about, but also we can find it in Italy and Peru. If we're talking just the United States, there are four key places where you'd find these major mercury deposits being mined. There is mercury found in Texas and Arkansas that has been mined for some time. Some significant deposits in Alaska, and we can't forget California and Nevada. All right, well, another successful day of rock hounding and another geo adventure today. I will be having a lot more geo adventures from these regions, including a lot more looks at interesting minerals in this mineral belt along the Nevada and California border. So stay tuned, join me on the next adventure. I'll see you guys next time.